Good morning everyone, the message will be going live in five minutes time, so why don't you refresh your page, make yourself ready, prepare your heart and mind to hear God's word this morning. As someone joked to me last week, when we actually get back into being the gathered church at K Street, am I actually going to say to everyone then, right, before the sermon starts, go and make yourself a brew, make yourself a cup of tea? Well, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? But anyway, if you want to go and make yourself a brew or a coffee, prepare your heart for the message which will start in just under five minutes time. Thank you. Good morning everyone, the message will be going live in two minutes time, so again refresh your page, get yourself ready and I'll be back in two minutes with the live message from God's Word. Thank you. Well, good morning everyone and welcome to our service online today. It's great to be with you. I want to say a big thank you to everyone who took part in uh, putting together this morning's service. We are just a fantastic bunch of truly gifted people and I do give you enormous thanks. And David, I'm really sorry that I disturbed your breakfast. At the end of the message today, uh, as David has already shared with you, uh, we are going to share communion together and there will be a slight logistical change as we do that. 
but I'll explain how that's going to work uh, at the end of this message. So we begin a new series today and I am really excited about commencing, sharing, inaugurating this series with you. But first, a story. In the autumn of 1992, that was to be the autumn that would change my life forever. Because it was at that time that having been uh, dating Ali for around four years at that point, I decided, I plucked up the courage that I was going to ask her to marry me. So I booked the restaurant, I had the ring, I had everything in place and it was one of our favourite uh, restaurants as well so I knew the, the food and the ambiance and everything that Ali would like so I, just everything was set and um, I just thought well I'm not going to kind of kick off with that straight away, we'll wait, we'll have chat, we'll have food and wine and we'll just enjoy ourselves and then towards the end I'll pop the question. And then it got, to the, it got to the point and I started to find myself kind of getting more and more nervous. Will she say yes? And then towards the end of the evening, just as we were finishing the pudding, I said to her, Ali, I love you. Will you marry me? Old words uh, to that effect. And it was at that point she just burst into tears. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh my goodness, is that tears of joy or is that tears of, are you having a laugh? And thankfully, it was tears of joy. And when she composed herself, she said, yes, I will marry you. And it was at that point that I started to cry as well. So both, both of us were descending into tears, no doubt, with everyone around us kind of looking at what is the matter with these two. The reason I share that story with you is once... Ali had said yes and it was it was on we couldn't wait to share it we couldn't wait to tell everyone we phoned our parents we I phoned my sister I phoned my wider family and circle of friends I couldn't wait to tell my friends at church we just wanted to tell everyone because we had good news to share it was news because something had happened and it was also good because it was going to have a really positive impact on us and I have absolutely no regrets and here we are 25 and a half years later into our marriage absolutely no regrets whatsoever and that's what I meant at the beginning when I said it did change my life but I want us to think about good news and proclaiming the good news and declaring the good news. And I start with this illustration because I can think the Christian faith in its earliest forms was presented as good news. Jesus and his followers and then the early church lived out John 3.16 if you like. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And they, they went to the height and depths and breadth geographically to share that news. Because it had so transformed them and compelled their lives. They lived that out. And many will know that the original meaning of the old English word gospel means good news. But I have a question this morning. And it's a question that's been going through my mind this week as I've prepared for this message. Is that what people think when they hear the good news? Because if it's that good, why are there so many people out there thinking that the gospel is anything but good news? Now, you could say people have heard the good news, but they don't respond or God convicts them of sin and they're not ready to repent yet. I hear all of that. I'm not arguing against that. But for the majority of people I have spoken to in ministry, and I've been in ministry a long time, for the vast majority, when they hear the good news about Jesus, often they've not heard it as good news. And that makes me sad. And it breaks my heart. And I want to ask the question, what has happened? Because for me, I think there's a communication problem. 
Tom Wright argues that the idea of seeing the Christian faith as news that is good is itself, ironically, news to many people today. Even those who know in theory that this is what the gospel means often fail to appreciate the significance of this fact. What I believe we need to do and what we're going to look at in this series is to ask afresh, what is the good news that Jesus himself announced? How did he live it? How did he proclaim it? How did the early church declare it? And what does it mean for us to announce good news today? Many people, including many Christians, I guess, and I'm probably guilty of it myself, never ask themselves this question. We assume that we understand the gospel because it seems so familiar, it's so entrenched into our psyche. The word gospel now carries different meanings. Some of you may have heard the following phrases or even used them. When we want to stress how reliable something is, we talk about gospel truth. When we want to explain how someone might become a Christian, we talk about preaching the gospel. For others, gospel simply means a type of music, a specific genre. And that's okay, by the way. I'm not saying that's wrong. But when Jesus and the early Christians spoke of good news, which they did a great deal, they meant so much more than this. They really did see it as news. And they believed that this news was so good that it was worth announcing to everyone and even went to their deaths for it. Have we lost sight of just how good this good news is? Over the next seven weeks, we'll be exploring what this news is and what's so good about it. Johnny next week is going to help us look at how Jesus demonstrated the gospel in Luke chapter four, when he kind of laid out his manifesto and he said, guys, this is this is what I'm about. We will consider together how the spirit ignites the gospel with a special Pentecost theme. And John is going to help us to consider that. And then the following three sessions, we'll consider how the gospel announces the kingdom of God, what the way of the gospel is, and that the gospel has power. But all that is to come over the coming weeks. I'm really excited about sharing this series with you. But this morning I want to kick this brand new series off with the most simple yet profound statement and that is Jesus is the gospel. There are two readings this morning and I'll be focusing my thoughts primarily on the passage from Colossians and a big thank you to Stephen and to Timothy for reading so beautifully this morning. But I couldn't ignore this one verse from Mark's gospel. So let's look at it again. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As Mark declares at the beginning of his gospel, the good news is all about Jesus. Blink and you could miss this incredible declaration that Mark is making here. Mark wrote his gospel in the form of a fast-paced story. It's led some to describe his gospel as the thriller gospel because it's 16 chapters of Jesus backing up his words with actions that demonstrate who he is, the Son of God. We mustn't forget that Mark is writing this gospel primarily to Christians in Rome where many gods were worshipped. And he wanted them to know Take confidence in that Jesus is the one true Son of God. So important for us to grasp right at the start of this series, before we even look at the different aspects of the gospel, that we begin by declaring that Jesus is the gospel and the gospel is good and it is news. That might, most, might be the most obvious statement you've ever heard. But it's worth considering the significance of how these two words relate the gospel to us. It is news because it points to information about a person, an event in history that totally shook the world, turned the world upside down, created a new reality. The person is God's son, Jesus the Christ, and the event is God coming to earth in human form that first Christmas as a tiny, frail baby which ignited God's kingdom on earth. His redemptive death on the cross and resurrection from the dead instilled a new reality for our present and a future hope that is coming. 
We cannot change the news. It's history. It's fact. But it does lead us to question, what does that news mean for us, for our families, for our friends and for this world in which we're living in? It is good because it has potentially a positive impact on its hearers. It is good because it means the possibility of a positive transformation for all who choose to receive it and believe and act upon it. It means the possibility of new life now in all its fullness and then on into eternity. The the good news does not simply contain a message that promotes good advice. The gospel is not advice. Neither is it an option amongst many. It is news that you can either accept, follow, choose to live in or not. And Mark declared right at the beginning of his gospel that Jesus Christ is good news. And as if to back up that, he declares that Jesus is none other than the Son of God. It's like he's laying his credentials out there for all to see and witness. And it's so important to look at those credentials as we think about the good news. And that's why I want to turn now to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Friends, can I be honest with you this morning? I love Jesus. My heart's been captured by Jesus. The God I love is the God of Jesus and none other. And I think it's important when we think about the gospel that we understand who Jesus is. And to help us do that, I want to consider briefly those verses from Colossians chapter 1. So let's look at verse 15 together. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Who is Jesus? He is for one, the firstborn over all creation. The cults and the sceptics sometimes use this verse to say that Jesus is the first created one, as though God created Jesus first and then Jesus did the rest. But that wouldn't work, would it? Because we go on to read in verse 16 that by him all things were created. Jesus can't be the creator of all things if he's one of the things that's been created. No, Jesus is not the first created one. He is the eternal son of God. There was never a time when he didn't exist along with his father and the Holy Spirit. In the Bible, the term firstborn refers to the heir, the one who inherits. And that makes sense. Verse 16 tells us that everything in all creation is for him. Every particle in this universe belongs to Jesus. He is firstborn over all of it. All of creation is a gift from God the Father to Christ, his eternal son. The father loves his son so much. He has given him an incredible present. The universe is like, here you go. Heaven and earth has a gift tag attached to it. And it reads, dear son, this is how much I love you. Love your father, Abba Father, Daddy. It's like, there you go, son. There you go. Love, Dad. When you see the beauty of the lakes, or the Scottish Highlands, or the downs, or rugged coastlines, or you look up at the stars at night, This is not a display of power from some distant, remote God. The universe is a gift of love from the Father to his Son. And it's not just that the universe is to the Son. The universe has come through the Son. The phrase, all things, is used repeatedly. It includes visible and invisible. That's earthly and heavenly things. Things of men and things of angels. Earthly rulers, spiritual rulers. Everything owes its existence to Jesus Christ. We live in a universe made by Jesus, shaped by Jesus, inherited by Jesus, held together by Jesus. That's verse 17. But don't you love verse 18? This just goes on. These verses are just fantastic, friends. And he is the head of the body, the church. Isn't that great? He's the creator of all and he's the head of the church. Now, if I was the creator of the universe, being a head of the church wouldn't necessarily thrill my heart. 
I'd be too pleased with myself about all my awesome power. But Jesus is different for him. Being creator of the world is a great thing, but here is where his heart is. A union with his people that is as close as a head is to its body. Christ's intimate union to his people, that's the centre of all creation actually. It's the masterpiece. Revelation talks about the church being the bride of Christ. How special, how intimate, how amazing is that? And this Colossians passage is declaring loud and clear, and he is the head of the body, the church. He loves the church and gave himself for it. And you think by now, wouldn't you, that Paul said enough. Paul has laid out the credentials. He's demonstrated just how amazing Jesus is. But he goes on. He goes on, folks. This is fantastic stuff. Just keep your Bibles open. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. This is verses 19 to 21. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. He's the cosmic creator in whom the fullness of God dwells, and he's reconciling his creation back to God. Scripture tells us quite clearly that we were once separated from God, a slave to our evil desires and facing an eternity without God. We couldn't save ourselves. We needed a saviour. And how did he do it? Does he fight some massive special effect battle in the heavenly realms? No, Does he do it by coming to crush his enemies in a display of infinite power? No. He makes peace through his blood shed on the cross. He descends into the battle. He descends into the huge chasm that separates us from God. He absorbs every blow of the enemy and never retaliates. He gets met by hatred and derision and he submits to it. The world rejects and mocks him and he takes it and he even prays. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He's thrust up into the air on that cross, hated by earth, facing the judgment of heaven, lifted up between the two criminals to die the death of the rejected. And the blood that pours down somehow is reconciling the world to himself. Just pause. Just pause now. In your living rooms, wherever you are. Just take a moment to think about that, especially as we gather to share in communion. The blood that pours down, the blood that poured down that cross was somehow, in a way I don't fully understand and I never will, was reconciling the world to Jesus. Reconciling the world to the Father. That's me and you. The fullness of God in this instance does not look like overwhelming power and awe. It looks like a saviour stripped and struggling for breath who loves us more than his own life. That's the fullness of God. Jesus Christ crucified for me and for you. It's good news. It's really, really, really good news. I wonder what picture does God have when he thinks about you, when he thinks about me. Look at verses 22 to 23. But now God has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel. See what Paul's emphasising there. This is the gospel 
that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. You know, every night when it's my turn to put Livy to bed, do you know what I do? We've just started this thing. I say to her just before um, I put her down in her cot and we've said prayers and we've had a story. And I say to her, how much does how much does daddy love you? Is it is it this much? And she goes, no, because she knows what's coming because we do it every night. Is it is it this much? She goes, no, daddy. She's got a big smile on her face. She goes, is it? I go, is it this much? And she goes, no. I go, is it this much? She goes, no. And I go, well, is it this much? Yay! Because it's as far as I can possibly stretch. That's how much I love her. And you see her little face when she responds to that. It's like, wow, my daddy loves me that much. And I thought about this. If that's how much I love Livy, how much more does God love us? How does God look at you? Well, he looks at you, you're holy in his sight. Without blemish. Free from accusation. Spotless. Spotless. The past forgiven and a glorious hope for the future. Everything that we've ever done or thought, God forgives. Not that he condones, but he forgives. Friends, this is not dinner switch Christianity. Some weeks you're okay, some weeks you're a bit gloomy. If you belong to Jesus, you are loved by the Father with the same love he has for his son. How much? How much? How much? How much? And he stretched out his arms and said, it is finished. And the resurrection three days later confirmed it. Ratified it. Authenticated it. To all of us caught up in this global pandemic that is COVID-19. Some of us are on the front line, some of us aren't. Some of us are really, really struggling. Some of us are finding new rhythms to life. I pray that this message this morning of a God who loves, who loves you infinitely rest in that love this morning whatever is coming up this week for you at work at home whatever your situation presents you know that you are loved without blemish free from accusation spotless presented holy in God's sight Wow, that's the God I love. That's the God who's won my heart. That's the God that I want others to know. And that's why it's such good news. Friends, how massive is the gospel? And that's why we want to spend the next seven weeks thinking and reflecting on this good news that is the gospel. I want us to redress the communication problem that I referred to at the beginning. I want people to know the fullness of this good news because it really, really can change people's lives. Amen. Let's just have a moment of, of quiet before we lead into communion together. God, just remind us again this morning just how loved we are by you. Just let that truth penetrate, sink deep into our hearts this morning. 
that we are loved by the Creator. The Creator of all things. And there isn't anything that we can think or say or do that will make God love us any more. And there is nothing that we can think, do or say that will make God love us any less. Jesus, thank you that we can never outguess you. That we can never outthink you, outsmart you. And when we ask that question, how much do you love us? You answered that question by sending your son who came and lived amongst us and died on a cross and rose again so that we might have life and life in all its fullness. Jesus, this is good news. And I want to say to people tuning in today, signing in, that if this is the first time that you have heard this amazing gospel message and you want to find out more, please don't hesitate to contact either me or Johnny. Go onto the K Street website, Facebook page, you'll see our details there where you can contact us. Don't let this opportunity go. Receive the good news because it truly is good news. So Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. We thank you that Jesus is the good news and that he is the Son of God. And we give you our thanks and our praise that we can know him and love him and serve him and follow him for the rest of our days. And we come in his precious and powerful name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Don't adjust your devices, okay? Please don't do that, all right? We're, we're going to cover the camera, and I'm just going to change position and we're going to be back with you in just a few moments, all right? So please, please don't adjust. Think you've lost it. You haven't, okay? We're just going to change position to prepare our hearts for communion. Thank you. Friends, I hope that you can uh, see me, but, but more importantly, I hope that you can see uh, the elements here uh, in front of me. Bread that we're going to break to remember Christ's body that was broken. Blood that was shed that we will remember in the form of, of wine or grape juice. It's fine. But the reason that I can talk about what I've just talked about now is because of the great sacrifice that Jesus paid for each one of us. And when he gathered with his friends that, that last supper before his trial and subsequent death and resurrection, he said to his friends, look, this is what I want you to do to remember me until I come again. I want you to remember me by breaking bread. I want you to remember me by sharing wine. And this is just such an amazing privilege for me in this context to be able to share with you now. So we're going to use some familiar words this morning. 
Words that perhaps we've not heard for some time. And I don't know about you, but sometimes, and as someone who kind of leads communion a lot, sometimes you can almost just become, I don't know, fatigued by saying these words. And it's like, oh gosh, I'm saying them again, I'm saying them again. And what God has taught me through this period, one of many things he's taught me, is to treasure everything that we have. To treasure everything that God has given us. To not take things, people, situations for granted. So I'm going to use some familiar words that I hope bring to life the elements as we share in them together. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And Jesus isn't just talking about the physical things that sustain us. The physical food that we eat or the drink that we, that we take, partake in that nourishes our soul. This is the, the spiritual aspect of what Jesus gives to us day by day. He, he feeds us. He sustains us. He sustains our soul. And he says, whoever believes in him will never be hungry. Come to this table not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. And some familiar words from 1 Corinthians 11. The Apostle Paul tells us of the institution of the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What a wonderful promise that is. Until he comes. One day. Jesus will come and take us all to be with him. All those who have called on the name of the Lord. Let's pray together. Loving God, we praise and thank you for your love shown to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life and ministry, announcing the good news of your kingdom and demonstrating its power in the lifting of the downtrodden, and the healing of the sick, and the loving of the loveless. We thank you for his sacrificial death upon the cross, for the redemption of the world, and for your raising him to life again, as a foretaste of the glory we shall share. We give you thanks for this bread and wine, symbols of our world and signs of your transforming love. Send your Holy Spirit, we pray that we may be renewed into the likeness of Jesus Christ and formed into his body. This we pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Let's take the bread and remember, and we'll have a moment of quiet. And in the same way, after supper, and as I say these words, just kind of have to hand your cup or little kind of chalice, whatever, whatever you have, however formal or informal you want to make this, just have it ready because I, I want us to drink together as a sign of the gathered community of Christ here online. So in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So we drink to remember Christ's blood shed for us and be thankful. Amen. A prayer as we draw our service to a close. Your death, O Lord, we commemorate. Your resurrection we confess. Your final coming we await. Glory be to you, O Christ. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your glorious name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen. Friends, God bless you. Stay safe this week. My prayers are with you. And I just, yeah, love you guys and just standing with you. Stay safe until we meet again.